I love Halo. It is a game franchise that over the course of my lifetime, I've been ecstatic to learn about and cherish. My first ever Halo I played in its prime was Halo 3, but I went back and played the others years later, and there's been countless hours I've lost to playing the games and learning about its amazing and expansive lore. But how did it all start? Well, with the first three games, of course. What if we went back nowadays and saw how they held up? Would they? Would they not? Does anyone even care? I hope you do, because we're about to dive into Halo Combat Evolved. So, you wanna play some Halo, eh? Well, there's some things I think you should understand when going in. One of the biggest things to understand about Halo Combat Evolved going into these videos is to forget everything you know about Halo Combat Evolved. In this series of scripted videos, I'm going to try to cover at least the first three Halo games in the mainline series, as they are quite old at this point. The first one in particular being 23 years old as of the writing of this script. Oh. Oh my god. Holy crap, I'm old. Ugh. Why are these games ancient now? I remember Comet Evolved was still somewhat new when I was a kid. Now it's like ancient. All these kids and their damn fork knives and dangerous cooperation and their five morrows at Frederick Barrington the thirds. Halo Comet Evolved originally released on the Xbox. The original one. One with the Duke controller. Not going to lie, the Duke looking back was not a great controller. I'm glad that 360 innovated the controller into something that is a lot better than what the Duke was and still is one of the best controllers to this day with some slight modifications. But I'm sure there's going to be some old heads who wouldn't approve of that opinion, but I think it's a valid criticism for a controller of a design that old. Weird side tangent, same thing with the Nintendo 64 controller. But does anyone else in hindsight think that the N64 controller was like a really weird decision and it was kind of hard to use? Like sure it had its own individual charm, but it, it, it isn't something that like I felt was a specifically good controller. Like at least the GameCube controller was kind of onto something with dual sticks. Nah, I don't know. So jumping into the first mission of Halo Comet Evolved, we are placed into the waking shoes of the space cyborg cowboy Master Chief. Yes, you heard me right. Space cyborg cowboy. I get this general vibe from Halo Comet Evolved that Bungie had a vague idea what they were going for, but they were just kind of like, fuck it, let's see where it goes and kind of went willy nilly with it. Not saying that the game is bad or hastily made or anything like that, but since it's the first game, Bungie kind of didn't know what they were doing, and that's to be expected. Anyway, back to the cyborg cowboy. That's originally what Master Chief was supposed to be. So you're playing as a half-human, half-cyborg person in some really powerful armor, if it even was supposed to be armor in the first place. I'm not even 100% sure Master Chief was supposed to be a quote-unquote Spartan yet. He was just referenced in Combat Evolved a lot as cyborg. And the cowboy part from, from two pieces of evidence supporting this are that the one melee animation for the Magnum, you know, the one, and also the fact that you complete the mission, if you complete a mission on Heroic or Legendary without dying, you get the commendation Flawless Cowboy. It's also the name of the first act of the second mission in the game. So now we know that you're a cowboy cyborg. Well, what are you fighting? What are these weird guys who run around flailing their arms or say wart 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 a lot and carry around shields that announce, hey, I'm over here numb nuts? Well, those guys are the Covenant. They're a conglomerate of space aliens who are quite literally speed running their way to suicide. Yes, that's right. Their entire organization's goals is to kill themselves. I'm not kidding. They just don't know it. Anyways, back to the first mission. It's called the Pillar of Autumn, and I bet you'll never guess... Oh... Oh, well, I thought I was being clever, but I guess it's just right there. You're woken up after being attacked by the woke suicide squad of the galaxy, and you have to defend the already lost cause of the autumn from atomic plasma-based annihilation. Oh, also, there's the halo. Oh, there it is! It's the thing! The namesake of the game! The thing! There it is! The thing! They did it! There it is! The thing! The captain order used to the bridge, but not before having the lore written tutorial that I'm sure has ruined plenty of kids' FPS experiences for the rest of their lives. I'm going to invert your looking pitch so you can see 
if you like it better that way. It kills me just to think about how many kids ruin themselves by accidentally turning inverted controls on and thinking it was normal and just learn to play like that for the rest of their lives. I feel so sorry for you if you're one of those kids. On the way to talk to the captain, you might get jump scared by a simple explosion, then meet the best character in all of Halo. At least one of them. Sir, the captain needs you on the bridge ASAP. Better follow me. The Aussie guy that talks to you and asks you to follow him. His name is Chips Dubbo. He's technically a canon character that survives like all of major Halo's major events somehow, some way, and nobody can really tell how or why he survived all of it. The captain tells you to get the ship's AI, Cortana, off the ship and away from the enemy. Then he gives you a Magnum, the most broken weapon in the entire game. I don't keep it loaded, son. You'll have to find ammo as you go. With no ammo. Like, I get the moral high ground or whatever, but, like, you're fighting aliens that want to wipe out your entire race just to kill themselves. Why are you thinking about a moral high ground with aliens? That's like if spiders took over the earth and someone was like, No, I don't want carry weapons on me because I think violence is wrong. It's a fight for your species, man. It doesn't seem to matter, though, because randomly, without any warning, it just appears, your, appears in your hands with, like, a full magazine and ammo. Like... Huh? I think I remember reading somewhere or being told somewhere that Chief finds ammo in the hallway just from like a magnum maybe lying there, but like, there's just not. There's no magnum in the hallway. There's no armory or ammo crate around. Chief just decides, oh yeah, I have ammo now. It's one of those things that I was saying from before that just seems like Bungie was just kind of willy nilly. Haha, <laughs> let's just do whatever, man. Oh, the player doesn't have ammo yet because the captain is like morally conscious of like ammo and like whatever. Nah, fuck it. Just give him ammo anyway. Whatever. One of my biggest criticisms of the Pillar of Autumn, and honestly, kind of the game as a whole, is that these missions have, like, terrible direction. Like, not sure why, what they were going for, man, but coming back and playing this game nowadays, you really miss the invention of the follow prompt or the quest marker. This mission doesn't really have anything too special with it for the most part. You're just kind of shooting aliens and trying to fight your way to a lifeboat to get the AI off the ship. There are a couple cool sections, like when you need to use corridors to sneak around and get the flank on enemies, which would be a ton of fun and be a lot more useful if the game had established stealth mechanics. It does have like some super like stupidly basic ones, but not an actual intentionally established or flushed out programmed stealth mechanic. Eventually, you'll get to a section where you have to clear out a group of Covenant, and when you do, Cortana will tell you to get on the lifeboat and leave. I don't think the cutscene really matters what lifeboat you walk up to. I know that there's just three docked in that section and you have to walk up to one to trigger the cutscene. When you do, Chief throws a scared marine onto the lifeboat by his belt loop. Once they're aboard, it launches from the Autumn to crash land on the Halo ring and the Autumn goes to crash on the ring as well. Captain Key stayed behind on the ship to go down with it because, you know, blah, blah, blah. Captain goes out of the ship, blah, blah. And that's first mission, Pillar of Autumn. Nothing truly special about it, aside from just introducing you to, like, plasma shield covers, the nav beacon, and grenades. Enemy types and most of the base weapons you'll really commonly see in the game, too. Still a lot of fun to shoot the aliens and see how the crewmen and marines take them down, too. The Halo franchise is one of those few that I feel like gives you AI teammates, and they're not just completely useless, and feel like if you let them sit around with the enemy AI in an environment long enough, they'll actually kill them all and move on in the environment instead of just getting caught in an endless cycle of shooting at each other from cover until the player steps in and kills the enemies for them to move on. Like, sure, there's some things that the AI can't do, so when it comes to moving throughout the geometry of the levels long term, it's impossible. But when it comes to the combat, they excel, where in other games like Call of Duty, the air are just kind of useless most of the time. They just sit behind cover and shoot at each other, and nothing really happens. The second mission of Combat Evolved is called Halo. Oh my god! Wow! They did it again! They said the thing in the thing! Holy moly! Alakazam! Those crazy fools! They did it again! At the beginning of the mission, you'll immediately notice that all of the marines that you had just with you on the lifeboat are completely dead. Like, they're just gone. No explanation, no nothing. They were fine, and now they aren't. Did Master Chief betray them because he wanted to be the solo badass cyborg space cowboy? Did he benevolently put them out of their misery because he knew the road ahead was going to be really hard? No. I found out later that it's actually because if you step like five meters to the left of the lifeboat, you'll see the bridge that you have to cross to progress in the mission. 
and Bungie couldn't get the Marine AI to cross the bridge all the way across without falling off the side and killing themselves, so they just decided to add their corpses in the lifeboat with no explanation to the player. Bungie just kind of went, well, if they want to die so badly, they can just stay dead. I like to think that in my personal headcanon that the lifeboat just kind of kept like shaking violently and because of the atmosphere of the ring, Master Chief just ping-ponged around like an oversized three-ton ping-pong ball and just smashed all the Marines apart, but they're not in paste because the armor was able to keep their bodies intact. I really like this part of Combat Evolved and I think throughout the video you'll get the same hypothesis that I have about my opinion that I'm a really huge fan of the first half more so than the second half of the game. The first half of the game I think was executed very well, and the second half seemed like it was a cobble of ideas that just kind of had to be put together with a bit of Elmer's and spit. Again, that's not to say it's a bad game, like the second half isn't bad by any means, even the parts that aren't that great to me personally still have some very good merit over a lot of other games we were seeing in 2001. I feel like a lot of other video games around this time kind of compared and compare us into Halo Combat Evolved. And like the only other game that even comes close in quality to Combat Evolved after a quick Google search, in my opinion, is Metal Gear Solid 2. And that just got off the tails of pissing everyone off because nobody gave a shit about Raiden. We wanted good old Solid Snake. Not a blonde Astolfo that preceded the actual Astolfo by 11 years. I liked Jack and Daxter, though. Do you guys remember that game? I played it ages ago on stream. Oh, hey, and Conker's Bad Fur Day came out in 2001, too. Anyways, moving on, I feel like the random banshees here that were, like, put in to hunt you down are a good touch. But I feel like since Bungie went, Lors, what if Pistol was, like, super OP? The Banshees aren't really too much of a threat. After the Banshee and some enemies, you're introduced to a much beloved character in the Halo series, although that's not established yet, in the form of Sergeant Johnson. Man, keep your eyes down range, fingers on your triggers, and we all go home in one piece. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. It's a mess, sir. We're scattered all over this valley. We called for evac, but until you showed up, I thought we were cooked. I believe I also remember hearing or reading somewhere that, like, even though Chips Dubbo and Sergeant Johnson are very much killable in this game, having them return again and again after dying was kind of a funny inside joke at Bungie, and a great way to keep the file size and resources down so that they could just keep reusing assets and models. The main plot of the mission is to go to these four or five locations and get the Marines and other humans out of the area and evacuate them to safety. They're being hunted down and killed, and as the badass cyborg cowboy, it's your job to save them. Although, if you're looking to complete the mission as fast as possible and like to beat the par time on the mission for, like, accommodation or whatever, you can literally just kill all of the marines in the areas, and it'll skip all of the defense waves in that area, and it'll just go to the next one. Cortana will even be, like, annoyed after the second or third time if you fail to save them, Almost as if she knows you're just showing up, killing them, and leaving just to get through the mission faster. Uh, what's wrong with ah. They're all dead. You didn't save them. Also, this mission introduces the legendary Halo Puma. May I introduce our new light reconnaissance vehicle? It has four inch armor plating, mag buffer suspension, a mounted machine gunner position, and Total seating for three. Gentlemen, this is the M12 LRV. I like to call it the Warthog. Why Warthog, sir? Because M12 LRV is too hard to say in conversation, son. No, but why Warthog? I mean, it doesn't really look like a pig. Say that again. I think it looks more like a Puma. What in Sam hell is a Puma? Uh, you mean like the shoe company? No, like a Puma. It's a big cat. That's been in so much media or referenced in so much media that it's insane. For example, in the show Scrubs, a character is playing Halo and talks about warthogs and jackals. In Dead or Alive 4, a warthog with three marines drives around on a map. The warthog has been in like every Forza game since Forza Horizon 3 because it is a Microsoft racing car game and Microsoft owns Halo. An animal can play with a warthog in the game Connectimals. God, that was a thing? Was it like 
Nintendo cats and Nintendo dogs, but an Xbox Connect game? That sounds terrible. Point being, Halo and the Puma have been around the block. Speaking of, in this game, you're lucky to even do that driving this thing, because no matter what surface you're driving on, it just feels like ice. It feels exactly like driving in Halos 2 and 3, but you have the power slide button down, held down the entire time. Also, immediately after getting the Warthog, you just drive down a hill. You drive down a hill and Cortana says one of the best lines in Halo of all time. This cave is not a natural formation. Someone built it, so it must lead somewhere. No, seriously, like, this is an entirely serious line of dialogue that is meant to be taken extremely seriously. Really, Cortana? You fucking think? I commend Bungie with this mission structure because, like, yeah, technically nothing happens in this mission, and they just kind of wanted to add some atmosphere and get a little ambitious with some of the environment. Ambition that we wouldn't really see come back except here and there in Halo Reach and really not come back true to form for the vision for another 20 years with Halo Infinite. Of course, the original Xbox can only do so much at the time, but for what it was and when it was, I think it did a really good job giving the vibe that you just crash landed on an expansive alien ring world where other aliens are trying to hunt you down and kill you, so you have to murder them back for survival. I think it's also worth mentioning as a little side note here before I wrap up this mission that there's also other lifeboats crash near these Marines. And at a couple of them, you can get a catch a sneak peek at a weapon coming up in the next mission. However, whilst you're playing, you already notice that you don't really need any other weapon in this game other than the Magnum. Because Bungie are insane. And one gameplay designer fucked with its damage before the game shipped, and it was never fixed. Pretty sure a dev or two have gone on record to say that the Magnum's power level was entirely a fuck-up that was just never intended to be pa that powerful, but people loved it so much after launch that they just never hot-fixed it in later versions and ports of the game. <sighs> Truth and Reconciliation Honestly, one of my least favorite missions of the entire game. I feel like this game would be a million times better if they actually like had proper stealth mechanics to a point, sort of like Reach did. But even Reach didn't have any, like, stealth mechanics and suppressed weapons. Even though as a side note in the books, like, Fall of Reach, which predates Halo Combat Evolved timeline-wise, they were using, like, suppressed assault rifles and stuff, so, like, I'm not sure what's worse. A Halo properly including optional stealth, or setting a mission up to be stealthy with no stealth mechanics. So you start off with a sniper, which is, like, a really good weapon, but the entire beginning, the Marines are just like, let the Master Chief take out the enemies all out quietly and then engage when he goes loud. Like, what do you mean? The second I do anything with this loud-ass rifle, it's gonna alert every alien in one kilometer radius. Look, even the aliens from the next canyon are coming over to reinforce because they heard all that fighting. What's the point of giving the player AI voice comms like that if they're not even gonna have any stealth in the game? At least in this mission, you're introduced to the Shade Turret and also one of my favorite Covenant species in all of Halo, the Hunters. The Hunters are, if you can believe it, a little colony of orange space worms that form like a hive mind and inhabit the armor together. I think ideas like that are really cool, and it's a lot more original than some of the other alien ideas I've seen in sci-fi stuff before. Like, yeah, elites are also really cool, and so are the grunts, but like, they're still bipedal, like, humanoid aliens that you fight and that fight you. The Hunters take a bipedal stance, but in actuality are something a lot better looking and designed. Apparently, the guy that made the Hunters and a lot of Combat Evolve's art said that he was inspired by Japanese mecha anime designs and such. So, I think that's pretty cool. So, after the Hunters, you go into the ship, and there's a kind of cool part with a camouflage elite with an energy sword. Sure, the energy sword is an iconic weapon to cut down enemies with now, but back then... It was actually something that only the elites could use. So when you kill the elites, they would actually drop the sword and the sword would just automatically and deactivate. I kind of hate the rest of this mission because it's just samey looking corridors with waves of enemies being thrown at you or patrolling. I get that the game came out in 2001 on a newish system, but hallways just being really copy paste hurts the overall mission structure. This also isn't going to be the last time we see corridors and other things being copy-pasted and reused to confusing results that are hard to follow. Other than that, I kinda don't feel like talking about this mission anymore. It's just kinda bad. Just repeating hallways and poor navigational design. 
the silent cartographer is by far the best mission in halo comet evolved hands down not only did they just decide to add an entire island for you to explore in the mission but the soundtrack as your pelicans fly in to assault the beachhead is like so fucking cool believe that what they call the silent cartographer is somewhere under this island. The cartographer is a map room that will lead us to Halo's control center. It's something that wouldn't really be created, recreated until a Halo th 3 mission, like way later down the line. Also, the Beachhead Assault is kind of like sci-fi cyber D-Day. Like, D-Day was horrible in real life, but in a video game, it's like the coolest thing ever. It definitely translates here. Also, kind of reiterating a point I made earlier in the video, the AI actually do something in this game. It's a game from 2001, but it's like the AI are still smart enough to do something about the enemies without the player's direct intervention most of the time. I also almost feel like it's too OP to use the pistol during the beach assault. Like, it kind of takes the grandeur out of the beach assault entirely if you're just headshotting every enemy with practically one hit. But I do it anyways. You know our motto, we deliver, is probably one of the best lines in Halo in general, let alone in Halo Combat Evolved. You know our motto, we deliver. So, Foe Hammer, which is the name of the Pelican pilot from the mission Halo as well, drops a puma off for you to explore the island. I remember seeing videos of people glitch launching this puma countless times across the map before, like, out through the top of the skybox and everything, but I don't know, nor was I really ever able to learn how to do it myself. I also almost forgot to mention that the Puma in Combat Evolved has like a nigh infinite mass in this game. Meaning that sometimes all it takes is like a little love tap at like five miles an hour on an enemy or marine, and it'll just eviscerate whatever it hits. When you're driving around the island as well, there's nothing you really have to fight unless you're at your objective. Meaning every enemy on the way to or from an objective is technically just optional fodder to mow down with your overpowered handheld blam cannon. So when you get to the door to the map room, it's pretty clear that you can get to the door faster than the elite can lock it sometimes, if you get lucky and try really hard, but even then it's still going not going to let you skip this part. <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. Which is rather unfortunate as it's clear you could accomplish it if you wanted. I wonder what happens if you could like kill the sword elite before the door shuts. Like obviously the door would still close and lock and it'd just be a dead sword elite behind a locked door? Or, but would he respawn later? Like, would you fighting him later still happen if you killed him before he locked the door? Or would he just stay dead? That'd be really funny if you just like turn the corner and there's just a dead elite there already. So once he locks the door, you need to find and fight your way up through a pathway towards where you go to unlock the door. Can I also just point out randomly that the plasma pistol does put in some like crazy work in this game? It's pretty insane how much damage it does, wait. I'm playing on easy. Uh, I mean legendary. I'm just that goaded. I, I've always been playing on legendary, I swear. When you reach the top of the path, you'll meet once again two of my favorite enemies in the game. This arena and fight is just so perfect in my opinion. I feel like this was more made as a tutorial to fight the hunters than the landing pad on Truth and Reconciliation was meant to be. Like, there's even a couple of pickups called overshields that give you double shield health, almost as if it's like, Hey man, fuck around and learn how these guys work with all the health in the world at your disposal. Really, figure it out! Then hunters become trivial for the rest of the game because you realize that if you just bait them into a melee attack and then pop one round into the fleshy worm parks with a blam cannon, they go down one round. So, the Magnum kinda ends up making hunter encounters trivial, but on the plus side, it makes for a fun like, Oh shit, time to swing better better! Moments that are easy, but still fun when they appear. Wow. I never realized how many overshields there were at this part of the mission. I've kind of always wondered, if an enemy elite accidentally wandered, like, onto these, would they pick them up as an overshield, or did just nothing happen? Like, it'd be cool if they could just unintentionally pick them up and activate them when they, like, stepped over them. Alright, now you're in Sardin. Oh, look. 
Another hunter pal. Wow, crazy. Not like you're ever using them now or anything. Look, I like the hunter encounters, but I feel like you shouldn't use them like more than once a mission. From memory, that's something Halo 2 did, right? And also from memory, I feel like 4 and 5 did the opposite. Come to think of it, I can't remember if Halo 4 had any hunters in it to begin with. I know that 5 and Infinite kind of made them like mini-bosses and not just a slightly more complex to take down base enemy, but I genuinely can't remember fighting a single hunter in Halo 4 from memory. And look at that, we unlocked the main door. At least they showed that hunters were guarding it, so it must have been important to guard. Also, there's like this random balcony or walkway that goes nowhere behind the button. Not sure what this is meant for, but it's just here. Just chillin'. So as you're making your way outside, you hear the mayday call of a pelican that Cortana called in but didn't tell you about. Why? I don't know. She thought you had better things to do than listen to her talk about her day, I guess. You go to meet- you get to meet the next new enemy type. The Camouflage Elites. Now there was a Camouflage Elite in Truth or Reconciliation, but that guy had a sword and he was easily spotted by the player. Trust me when I say that the first time I've ever played this mission, I must have walked right past those fucking elites because I didn't even know these guys were down here or existed until my second playthrough years later when Halo Comet Evolved Anniversary came out. So back outside with that same cliff in front of you. Oh, that's why the overshields were there. Turns out Cortana called in the pelican she didn't tell you about to get a rocket launcher to deal with the hunters, which is an interesting, which is an interesting concept because that implies that canonically, Cortana hasn't been observing the work the Magnum is putting in, therefore doesn't actually seem to comprehend or know how the combat that she's seeing happen in the head of the cyber cowboy that she's inside is actually going. I'm still going to take the rocket for whatever my gun is that's not the Magnum, uh, because it's really fun making Covenant aliens go boom. Too bad nobody told this Pelican pilot about the weapon drop pods that the Pelicans use in Halo 3. Seems like he could have used them right about five minutes ago. Also, there's a Puma here, and after taking it forward about three seconds is when you realize that this entire island is just one big loop. Like, it doesn't matter, because up till this point, the set pieces have been beautiful, and the mission has been so fun. And the fact that it's just a big tropical sand flavored fruit loop and a bowl of really watery milk is excusable. Also, you totally and definitely left those Marines for dead. Like, unless you went back and grabbed that Warthog again, there's no way they're going to do anything except sit in those, sit in those Puma seats for the rest of their entire lives. So after blammoing some hunters, again, I swear the amount of times they've overused them in this mission at this point is criminal. When you go back down into the area where the door locks, you move past it, and you're supposed to go left and continue on in the level. But if you go to the right, it actually triggers a cutscene that is completely optional. It's just Master Chief slowly walking up and looking over a forerunner cliff and going like, that's fucking deep, bro. Like a 14-year-old listen listening to Bullet for My Valentine for the first time. The next area is another one of those faux stealth rooms where you're prompted to use stealth because of the one elite right in front of you that has his back turned but instead no matter how hard i tried he's just there for like a free back smack kill and nothing more oh look they ever used the H hunters for like the fourth or fifth time this mission Whoopee! at this point in the game you may or may not have noticed that for the jackals the enemies with the shields bungie made them vulnerable to being vulnerable to being shot in their shooting hand if you're new at the game, it's hard to do, and in all entirety, it's just also something that when you pull it off, it's super satisfying. You get to the map room and you find out where Halo's control room is. So like, aside from the bajillion hunters they threw at you, I'd say a job well done and pretty easy, all things considered. They kind of send you out with one last hurrah of cloaked elites and wait. There's that sword guy! If you're not careful, and this is the first time you've played this game, he most likely jump scares the shit out of you. But then after he does, you kind of remember that plasma grenades exist, and you just hit him with one as he stands there pointing at you like the dope that he is for spotting you. But honestly, once you get good with the Magnum in this game, all the enemies in the game just kind of feel like cannon fodder. Even the hunters if you get good at the bull dodging mechanic. You board the pelican and prepare to assault Halo's control room. <laughs> See what I did there? So... 
Assault on the control room stars with Foe Hammer bringing you down into the ring from a section of the silent cartographer map. That like metal ring that you fought your first pair of hunters on. And as you come down, you scare a grunt as you hop out. Now onto the most obscure random thing I know about this game. For people who owned a Halo Combat Evolved strategy guide, I think it was, or maybe the game manual that came with the original Xbox game, I can't remember. But in that booklet, it talks about taking the Banshee for a spin to learn the controls. It was a Banshee that was cut from this area that you could take and learn how to fly before the big snowy chasm areas later on. By the way, this mission is mostly drab gray forerunner rooms and corridors with big snowy exterior areas and a bunch of Covenant and Marines fighting. Hey, look, there's Sergeant Johnson. Good thing you totally didn't kill him in the second mission. Right? We can also drive another Puma here, which is cool, I guess. But you also get to encounter ghosts and wraiths at this point. So the ghosts you can drive, but they don't have the boost functionality yet, like the later games, which is fine, because the maps aren't really that big in this game, so it's kind of unnecessary. But the Wraith isn't even drivable in this game. And the cannon on the back doesn't even fully deploy out of it. The best part of the entire mission by far has to be around the corner next to the downed pelican. And that's the scorpion tank. If you're anything like me, this thing will be your new best friend in like every Halo game for a while. The scorpion in this game has a main cannon like every scorpion. But its machine gun isn't a secondary seat that another AI, Marine, or player can sit in like the other games, and it's also controlled by the driver, and it kind of sucks. Like, it's pretty inaccurate compared to its later incarnations. Also, look! More hunters! I wonder what the tank- Oh. Oh no. You poor space worms. I also thought it was kind of weird when you have to shoot something next to the tank, but the marine's right on the side, so it's like... Okay. Bye, buddy. Bye, I guess. When you get, like, a chasm over, you fly a banshee for the first time. It's kind of confusing at first, but once you get the hang of the controls, it's pretty fun. Until you play every Halo game after and realize that they change the controls from Halo 2 on, so those weird controls and physics won't matter. Also, while the game is paused writing this script, I realize that at least on the MCC version of these games, the snow keeps falling while it's paused. It's fucking weird. After replaying through most of the mission, I forgot how long it is. Like, it takes a while to get through. I feel like if it was any other game from this era, this would be inexcusable, but since it's Halo and Halo's gameplay loop is good, it passes. Even if, but just slightly. It's at the end of this mission, however, that the game informs you through Cortana that there's been a horrible, horrendous evil that the Covenant has unearthed, or rather unringed, within a part of the ring, and now Master Chief... Cyborg Cowboy has to go investigate it. Now time for the second out of three infamous and iconic missions of this game, 343 Guilty Spark. The introduction of literally the most horrifying infection slash virus slash whatchamacallit in all of fiction, really. But we'll get there in due time. In the beginning of this mission, on easy, there's a shotgun that you can pick up from a downed pelican. It only shows up on easy difficulty. And fun fact, it's canon. In the official Halo book of this game, called Halo the Flood, the game's novelization, the Master Chief canonically picks up this shotgun, meaning that the canon difficulty of Combat Evolved is easy? But the difficulty selection says that Heroic was the way Halo was meant to be played. Wait a minute. Something ain't adding up there, Chief. You're in a jungle and there's some Covenant shooting at you. You have to secure a Covenant weapon stockpile or some sort of whatever that they might have there. Whilst also finding out what happened to Captain Keys and Sergeant Johnson and rescuing them. The downed pelican also gives you like this radio transmission saying that the captain was captured by an enemy. And through the garbling of the transmission, it might have sound like the enemies that took him weren't Covenant. Once across there, you'll get to the entrance where the Covenant seem to be getting held back by weapons fire. 
they look like human tracer rounds leaving the entrance, but when you get in there, there's nobody around but some Covenant Crace. Then the elevator comes up. Maybe the Marines went deeper into the facility. However, once you get down the elevator, there's more Covenant. And those Covenant would be dead if the Marines encountered those Covenants, so who was shooting at the Covenant outside? Hmm. After you're fighting your way through a bit, you'll notice some jackals standing in front of a doorway waiting for something to look like... It looks like they're waiting for something to come through the doorway. Presumably you, but it's not the right door. And in the middle of the room, you can see and hear some mysterious fluid dripping down from above. You go through the hallway that the jackals were looking at, and it is covered in alien blood. And the side room has, like, bodies in it. Sure seems like the marines did a stellar job clearing out the covenant. Then when you get through your next hallway, BLAM! A marine starts firing at you. If he or I jump scared you, then you most likely return to Magnum Round back into his skull. But if you do stop and listen to him or you revert checkpoint and don't shoot him, he talks about how he's not going to let you turn him into, quote, one of those things, and how, quote, he played dead to avoid the monsters. Stay back! Stay back! You're not turning me into one of those things! I'll blow your brains out! Get away from me! Find your own hiding place! The monsters are everywhere! Play dead! That's what I did! Play dead! They took the live ones! Oh god, I can still hear them! Monsters! Just leave me alone! Sarge, Mendoza, Vicente. Oh god, the thing stuck them. They're gone! Get it? Gone! Keep in mind, this is a universe where humanity is literally fighting monsters like elites, grunts, jackals, all of the Covenant. So the fact that he isn't naming any covenant enemies by name and he's just calling whatever it is a quote monster has got to mean something right so from here you can either kill him if you didn't already or what i do for the most part is i just walk past him he only shoots at you again if you get too close to him so walking past him away forces him to not shoot at you as you aren't close enough you'll then do some parkour and walk across a light bridge until you get to a room with two slopes going down each side a butchered marine on one side and, well, if it wasn't the Marines or Covenant that did this, then what was it? So, you watch Private Jenkins' Hell on Camera footage, and then you see it, in the bottom right corner, the Flood. Literally the most terrifying infection in literally all of sci-fi. Sure, the Borg, or Cordyceps from The Last of Us, or the virus in The Walking Dead is scary, but the Flood? No matter what continuity it is, always terrifying, can never be defeated, is literally immortal space dust, and exists as long as existence itself exists. Honestly, playing through this for the first time was terrifying, and I'm pretty sure this cutscene, along with the cutscene at the beginning of the original Nazi zombies in World at War, were just two scenes, just ruined me for horror games until recent years. I want to point out that just how nerve-wracking it is to deal with the flood in Halo. Like, seeing that first door bust down in the first defense part is, like, anxiety-inducing to the maximum. And then seeing those little, like, <laughs> fucking glowing bubbles, dude, I'm done. I'm also going to throw out here that I love Halo Combat Evolved, and it does have a special place in my heart. However, this retrospective from this mission on is probably going to get less involved and might seem more like I hate the game. 
because I'm going to be incredibly critical of it moving forward. Because like I hinted at earlier in the script, I do not like the second half of this game. The Flood are amazing, and I'm glad their introduction was so fucking cool. And some of the later missions do have cool moments. But they're ultimately not my favorite missions in this game. I really only ever think that the Flood hit their peak in Halo 3. And I mean, Halo 2's Flood was just kind of wacky. But I'll burn those bridges when I get to them in their rest respective videos. But after the holdout section, the game just gives you one last objective for this mission. Escape. Eventually, you'll blast and fight your way back out the same way you came in. And a little light bulbous boy by the name of 343 Guilty Spark teleports you out of the jungle into a new location called the Library. Turns out Guilty Spark is the custodian of this Halo ring and kinda, like, owns it in a weird way, which is also why he goes crazy on you later. But the music that plays whilst you're escaping the underground facility is iconically eerie but action-packed, perfectly fitting the style that Bungie wanted to go for for the Flood. Unfortunately, here's where things go considerably downhill in this game for me. Do you remember how samey and repeated the areas and hallways and textures inside the Truth and Reconciliation mission were when you were playing that mission? Well, that game design is back yet again for the library. This mission is quite infamous for being the worst in the game to play on Legendary just because of how fucking hard it is to get through in one piece. This is the only mission in this game that I can play on the easiest difficulty and still have a fucking hard time staying alive if I don't take my time and methodically wipe out every last infection form on each specific level of the area of the entire fucking map. Premise of the mission is really important, but also really fucking stupid. Like, the activation key called the index for the halo ring you know to activate halo's weapon that the covenant wanted on the ring for so long is right there in the middle of the room at the very bottom but in order to get a bridge over to unlock it like in order to physically grab it with like a bridge you have to climb all the way up to the top of the entire level in the entire chamber just to ride the elevator that's at the top of the middle back down to be able to reach it fucking what I think Gaz from COD4 says it's best. Oh, it's got to be taken a piss! We just busted our asses to get to this LG, and now they want us to go all the way back down! It is quite annoying and one of the worst designs. Sure, it's something to do. It lets the player fight and learn the different types of flood the player encountered in the last mission in a more clear-cut and straightforward way. But man, is it a chore to go up and then come back down just for something that was right there the whole time. The library just kind of feels like one large filler fetch quest mission just to like fill out the rest of the game not to mention that glitched wall that finally got removed from the anniversary there was a wall that they put in there in the remastered graphics but it was never there in the old game resulting in you being able to walk through a wall the next mission is two betrayals and the only thing story-wise to note is that we found out that we can't use halo to destroy the flood and the covenant like intended in the library because cortana informs you that after leaving her behind and digging around in a flood infested bunker that halo's purpose when activated is to wipe out all sentient life in the galaxy that's its purpose and that's what it was created to do the Covenant is a big suicide cult. Wipe out all life. And the Flood is immune to this weapon, by the way, because of course they are. But the whole point of the Flood's creepy ass is to consume and collect biomass, which is the broken down or consumed form of living things that create the growths and stuff that help spread the Flood. So if Halo kills all sentient life in the known galaxy, that is inclusive of anything that the Flood can use for biomass. The Halos don't kill the Flood, they kill the Flood's food. As... Cortana said, I think. I don't know if that's the exact quote, but she said it in the game. Gameplay-wise for the mission, hey, do you remember the mission Assault on the control room? Yeah. You know, the snowy one? It's that again. You're welcome. It's exactly the same, except the only objectives are a bit different than that game than that mission's. And you're also fighting Guilty Spark and his merry band of pull floaties that have laser beams. If you're playing Halo, any Halo, doesn't matter if it's one, two, three, doesn't matter which one. If you're playing a Halo, any Halo, and the Sentinels are giving you a hard time, just overcharge a plasma pistol. Problem solved. Once you stop Halo from being able to fire it by frying your own suit shields at some power nodes for the cooling system, you then head to save Captain Keys, who was captured by the Flood. 
Remember in, in 343 Guilty Spark, they said, oh, the captain was captured and it wasn't Covenant. Well, guess where they took him? Guess where you think they took him? Hey, do you remember the second mission? No, third mission of the game, Truth and Reconciliation? Yeah, it's that mission again. Only instead of saving keys from the Covenant, you're saving him from the Flood. Or at least you'll try to. But he was killed and formed into a proto-grave mind. Which is like the first stage of evolution the Flood has to get to in order to start developing the beginnings of their hive mind intelligence. Hey, remember all those slightly confusing purple hallways and other places that you remember before? Now not only do you have to go through them again, but now you're confused by them all over again because since the Flood's here, it's all dilapidated and nothing looks the same, so you're confused, but they all still look the same, so it feels like you're playing the third mission again. At least we get to see what a Covenant starship fuel looks like in this mission. I forgot to mention that Two Portrayals is like the longest fucking mission in the game, so by the time you're a third of the way through the Keys mission, you're more likely tired of playing the game by this point. So anyway, you kill Keys again, or defile, or defile his corpse if he was already dead, for a chip in his head, that rhymed, that has the Pillar of Autumn's command codes. Seeing Master Chief, who is a cyborg, by the way, the summary text to this mission says so, punch a hole through Keys' maybe dead skull to retrieve his brain chip is really badass and cool. Kind of makes you wish that Bungie and 343 really took initiative with the whole gross, gritty, flood horror mission thing in any of the future titles. Finally, you decide that the codes for the Pillar of Autumn you got from Keys' head are best put to use blowing up the Autumn to destroy Halo and save the galaxy. So, hey, do you remember the first mission of the game, Pillar of Autumn? It's that mission again, only with Flood again. So you have to blow up some cooling vents in the engine room to overheat the engine and blow up the ship. Probably the coolest thing about this game, other than the introduction to the Covenant and the Flood, is the Spec Ops Elite use that you see near the end that tries to kill you. Turns out this Elite was actually given a name and a whole fucking backstory in the lore and the novelization of the game, The Flood. His name is Zuka Zamami. Apparently, he'd been tasked with hunting down the Master Chief, like, the entire time you were playing the game, he was hunting you. And, well, you just kind of killed him and his grunt friend Yap Yap, so, like, get shit on. Shut up, bitch! <laughs> oh my God. The Maw ends, however, with the most badass driving section in any video game. The literally impossibly long Warthog run, where you have to sprint and drive across the entire entire pillar of autumn in a race against the reactor blowing up and escaping halo successfully without dying it's a nice little bow on the end of a game that for me was a great one until the second half oh hey also full hammer dies if you manage to find him there's also a secret grunt during the warthog run that can't wait to get back to his quote food nipple on the starship because he has a quote big grunty thirst What possessed Bungie to add this little freak? I'm not sure, but I love him to death. So, now that the Autumn and the Ring is destroyed, the Covenant and Flood are surely beaten, now there's nothing else. No more Halo games. Man, good thing that was only one game about a circular-shaped ring world with a cyborg cowboy who was just blasting aliens with his overpowered hand cannon. I really enjoy Halo Comet Evolved, enough that at one point I really got into speedrunning it for a little while. A good rule of thumb for me is, you know if I really love a game a lot, if I consider speedrunning it. If I ever just want to try to beat it as fast as I can, chances are it's a game that I really love. Meaning I just want to play it over and over and over again to learn it in and out. And when I say speedrunning, I don't mean like watching hours long YouTube videos on the world records and trying to get on the leaderboards. I mean like just how I described it now, just playing through it as fast as I can myself on my own. I do have a deep love and appreciation for Halo Combat Evolved, but I think all in all I was spoiled by what came after, and looking back I don't think it was as good now as it was back then, and that's okay. Some things age better than others and hold up better than other things. To me, Halo CE's first half has held up exceptionally well, but aside from the near horror game take it has in the Mission Guilty Spark, 
I feel like the flood levels really bring the game as a whole down. I feel like if Halo CE's flood levels were original areas that didn't just feel like a giant backtrack, then it would have been a lot better and did the flood more justice. But that's just my take and my retrospective. Leave your comments down below and let me know how much you love or hate Combat Evolved, and I plan on making at least two more of these for Halos 2 and 3. The better this video does, the faster the Halo 2 one will come out too. So, thanks for watching. Did anyone else make it? Scanning. Just dust and echoes. We're all that's left. We did what we had to do.